on each group. When you're ready to take that step, fill out our serve team form. This is a great step in getting connected. Members of our team will be able to find the best fit for you. We believe save people, serve people. So sign up today to become a part of our serve team family. We can't wait to celebrate Jesus with you. Now let's get ready to worship. Well, good morning, church family. Come on, someone stand to your feet. Are you ready to worship Jesus this morning? Here we go.
Christian Center. I'm so excited to be up here worshiping with you all today. I want to invite all of our in-person guests, but also our lovely online guests. Um, we are so excited to worship with you this morning. Here at Bellevue Christian Center, we believe that the presence of God is our what? First pursuit. Good job. <laughs> So I want to invite all of you forward to this altar. This is free space to be alone with the Lord right now. Um, so get out of your seats, move around, and find some space to just be with you and Jesus this morning. I encourage you to do it. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for every heart that's in this room, Father, looking for you, pursuing you this morning. Father, I pray that they see you this morning. I pray that you meet them exactly where they are. Meet them face to face, Father. Let them see you this morning. I pray that not a single person leaves this room without feeling the presence of God. I thank you so much for every heart in this room willing to pursue you this morning. We thank you, Lord. We trust you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who is thank you, Lord? Darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Declare that this morning, come on. My God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Belongs to you, Jesus. There is no weapon that may be formed against us.
One more time, church. church right now let's just offer up a hand clap of praise this morning come on let's worship our God our King this morning he is worthy to be praised this morning hallelujah Psalms 104 says enter into his courts with thanksgiving enter into his gates with praise this morning God's presence is here with us He's here with us and we are, are, are able to collectively come together and to declare how great our God is one and with one another. Come on, he is so good. He's worthy of it all. I love that song that we sang the song before. It just said, oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Come on, church, like we don't want to get shy in our, our praise for our God this morning because he really is worthy of it all. Man, I just love God. I love God. Would you guys just pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for this time of worship. God, this opportunity we've had to come together as a family. God, to just lift up your name and to give you glory. God, you are worthy of it all. And God, even in the midst of when things aren't the way we think it should be, God, you're still worthy. God, you, you're still sovereign and God, you are still good. And so God, we just praise you this morning. We give you our very best. God, we just, we just want to lift our voices and we just want to sing and we just want to praise you because, God, you are so good and, God, we can't get enough of you. God, how sweet it is to be in your presence, to sit here with you, God, and to be changed from the inside out, to allow your Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts and our souls this morning. God, we give you all the praise in Jesus' name today. Everyone said Amen, amen, amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, can you guys, before you grab a seat, just take a moment and turn around and say hi to a few folks that are near you, welcome them, um, introduce yourself maybe to somebody that's new. If you're watching online, we just wanna say a big welcome to you as well. Thank you for tuning in this morning, watching with us live, and uh, we just pray that God's presence is with you wherever you're watching from this morning, whether it's in your homes, in your cars, wherever you find yourself. We just wanna, we just wanna welcome you, and we just thank you for being here with us this morning. Awesome, awesome, awesome. God is good, amen. Come on, God is good, amen? Amen, amen. Hey, we just wanna take a moment. If you are new here for the very first time at Bellevue Christian Center, we just wanna take a moment just to say welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. If it's your very first time, we just and hope that you have an opportunity just to get to know a little bit about who we are. We believe that, that we are here to saturate our city and our world with the heart of God, and we would love the opportunity to get to meet you. So if you have a chance, there's some Connect cards in your seats, um, or if you don't get a chance to do that, stop by the Information Center out in the lobby. We have a special gift that we would love to get you, and I would love just the opportunity to be able to meet you after service today if, you're t if it's your first time, and we would love just to get connected with you. So feel free to stop by and do that. We, would, we just want to be a part uh, of your journey and what God is doing through your story. So make sure to say hi to us this morning. And we're going to continue our worship today by just um, by, by worshiping through our giving. And uh, we've got an incredible opportunity with the holiday season here coming up, coming up and just some opportunities that God has presented to us as a church body to be able to help meet the needs in our community and to continue to be for Bellevue. And so one of the things that you will notice when you're out in the lobby is we've got a Christmas tree set up and we've been partnering with Priority Family Services uh, to help meet the needs of foster kid families within our community. And so on that, that foster care tree, on that tree is, is a bunch of names of, of kids that we're gonna be providing Christmas presents for throughout this holiday season between now and uh, beginning of December. And Priority Family Services every year puts on this really amazing Christmas party for all the kids in their, in their foster care system. It's about 80 kids this year that we get to provide 
hide the, the Christmas presents for. And that's coming up here in a few weeks. And so we encourage you guys, if you have the opportunity, stop by the tree, pick up a name of a student or a kid that you can help provide Christmas for this year and help us partner with Priority Family Services. These go fast every year. So if you are interested in doing that, make sure to grab that quickly after service. But we're excited just to be able to um, continue to give and be a part of what God is doing here at Bellevue Christian Center. Amen. And we thank you guys for your giving, your continued support of everything that's happening here. And uh, we just want to take a moment just to pray over our offering this morning and the gifts that are received. So if you could just pray with me, that would be awesome. God, we just thank you so much just for today, God. And um, God, that you are more than enough for us today. And God, we just thank you for the gifts that are being received. God, we thank you for, God, how you are ministering to the city of Bellevue and surrounding areas. God, our heart is to be for Bellevue. And God, we just pray that through the gifts that are received and God, the faithfulness of your people here, God, that you would continue to just meet the needs of those who are in need in our community. God, we, we wanna be for Bellevue. We pray, God, that you would stir it in our hearts, God, to continue to be there for our community however we can. And we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Welcome team, you guys can go ahead and begin passing the plates. Um, I'm gonna take a moment just to dismiss all of our amazing middle school students. We've got a special service for you guys back in the chapel. Thank you guys for being in here with us for worship, but we want the opportunity for you to just be able to allow God to speak to you on your level. So give it up for our middle school students one more time as they head out. It's a small army of middle school students that we are excited for what God is doing in their hearts and in their lives. And so we're excited for them. I also, at this time, want to welcome up all of our new members. We've got a great group of new members to Bellevue Christian Center. These are people who have taken the step in their journey to say, this is my church home. They've gone through our membership class over the last few weeks, and, uh, and they've, they've decided, hey, we want to be a part of what God is doing. So we've got um, a group of new members. Um, some of them are helping down in kids' ministry area. So uh, if you guys are, there they are, they're coming. Uh, the Callaway family, the Nepple family, and the Neederts, they're all coming up. And we're excited just to welcome them as new members here to Bellevue Christian Center. And uh, if you guys can give them a hand. Go ahead, give them a hand. And um, we see this as just a really important step in a person's discipleship journey to be able to say yes to planting themselves in a local body of Christ and saying, we're gonna give of our time, our energy, our resources to be a part of what God is doing here in this expression of, of his church. And so we're excited for these individuals who are becoming members today. We're gonna introduce them to you. We're gonna allow them to introduce themselves to you and how long they've been going here. So I'm gonna start down here. Are you okay with that? All right, can you just say your name and how long you've been coming to Bellevue Christian Center? I'm Jocelyn Neppel and I've been coming here since January. Awesome, awesome. I'm Crystal Neppel, and I've been coming here since January as well. I'm Sean Neppel, and I've been coming here since January as well. Awesome. <laughs> I'm Chris Calloway. I've been coming here since January too. That's awesome. We love it. Karen Calloway, January of this year. Uh, Keith Calloway, I'm with them. He's with them. <laughs> Uh, we're different. Uh, we, <laughs> I'm Joe, and we started in March. <laughs> and I'm Courtney, and I'm with him. Yes, awesome. Awesome. So like I mentioned before, these are all amazing individuals who have gone through our membership class and, and uh, have taken this step in their discipleship journey to say that this is where they want to be and uh, how they want to serve God through their local body of Christ. And so we're going to just take a moment just to pray over these new members. And uh, I'm going to invite our pastors and our prayer team members to come pray with me over these guys. And um, we just know that God has some amazing things in store for them and some amazing plans for the ministry that God has placed on their heart to be expressed here at Bellevue Christian Center. So we're just going to lay hands and pray over these individuals. If you guys want to stretch out a hand and pray with me, that would be awesome. God, we just thank you so much for these amazing, amazing new members here at Bellevue Christian Center. God, we are so blessed to have them a part of this body of Christ. And God, we know that you have put it on their hearts, God, to do some amazing things for you. God, that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every single individual in this room. And God, these individuals have taken that step, God, to plant themselves here. God, to help saturate our city and our world with the heart of Christ. And God, we just pray as a church that we would come alongside of them, encourage 
encourage them in the word, encourage them in their faith, but God, they, they would also just give of themselves to you, God, that they would give their time, their energy, their resources, their talents, God, to just be used to glorify your kingdom. And God, we thank you for how you're going to bless them, but God, we thank you for the blessing that they are to this body of Christ as well, to Bellevue Christian Center. And so God, we pray blessings over them, and God, we pray you would be with them, be with them as they serve in our kids' ministries, our welcome team, our tech team. God, everywhere that they're serving right now, God, we just pray blessings over them. And God, we pray that you would continue to use them in amazing ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. 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 They're going to go find their seats. And as they do, why don't we just take a moment to find out what's happening here at BCC. Throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. Well, I am excited for this Christmas season. I'm excited that we're almost there. Anybody else excited about it? Yeah? Awesome. Well, I just have, I, I have a couple things to say about this upcoming Christmas season. And the first thing that I want to say is any of you in this place, or maybe you're online, who have already put up your Christmas tree and your Christmas decorations, I just want to tell you, you did it wrong. You did it wrong. We got Thanksgiving first, then Christmas. Now, some of you, Christabals, <clears throat> who have been celebrating Christmas since last December. We don't want to spoil your fun, but we do want you to know that there's a the Bible's clear, there's a time and a season for everything, okay? The second thing that I just wanna say about this coming Christmas season, you just saw that video that we're going to be jumping into a series at the beginning of December, Christmas at the Movies. And it's our heart just to have some fun, to use some maybe familiar stories to point to the truth of the gospel. It's our hope that as we use these stories and we walk through these different popular movies that maybe, just maybe, you'll never view that movie the same ever again. Because every time you watch it or you see the title, you'll think, of how Jesus left his position in heaven to come to this earth to rescue sinful people like you and I. And it's our desire that as we have fun with this, as we celebrate this Christmas season together, as we enjoy this time together as a church, that you would also feel so inclined to invite your neighbors, to invite your coworkers, to invite your friends, to invite people that you know just need to hear the good news of the gospel. It's our hope 
It's our belief that as we preach the gospel through this month of December, that we're going to see lives transformed, that we're going to see people who are right now living in hopelessness receive a fresh hope and walk in a new way. So I hope you'll join us in December as we go into Christmas at the movies. Now, this morning, I have to tell you the honest truth is that I'm a little bit tired. Myself and another team full of people, we flew into Omaha last night. We touched down around 11.30 p.m., we got our bags, and for some reason, I have no idea why Epley was packed last night, why everybody was flying into Omaha uh, at 11.30 at night. But uh, as of this moment, I'm running off of a whole lot of Jesus and Cafe Con Leche. So I'm, I'm feeling really good at the moment, uh, but we'll see how long that lasts. No, we, we do just want to take a moment and just celebrate over this past week, Bellevue Christian Center, you sent a field team, a Convoy of Hope field team to Ponce, Puerto Rico. And so I just want to have the team, if you're here, can you stand if you went on this trip? Let's give it up for them. Stay standing. Stay standing, please. Okay, so church, they're all standing up, and, and, and I wanted a moment just to recognize them. Church, you would be so proud of this team, the hard work that they put in, the compassion that they, they interacted with people with. I mean, they were just a, an incredible, incredible team. But the reason I want them to stay standing is so that all of you can look and you can see their faces. And so if you're up front, you need to turn around real quick, let people see your faces, do a 360. Because here's what I want you to do, church. At some point, whether today, next week, in a couple weeks, I want you to find one of these individuals and I want you to ask them, what did God do in and through you on this trip? I want you to go and ask one of these people, what did God do on this trip? How did he use you? What did he show you? I especially want any of you who are curious about what it's like to go on a missions trip, to find one of these people and to hear their story of what God did in them and through them over this past week. All right? All right? And I said, I'm the tired one. Y'all need to pass out Cafe Con Leche to all of you. All right, let's give it up for this team one more time as they are seated. And I want to invite just a few of the team members, you know who you are. They're going to come and they're going to share just a few testimonies about what God did in and through them over this past week. Now, some of you may be wondering, are we still going to be talking about Genesis this week? And, and, and yes, as we share, as we hear these testimonies, and then when we dive into the word together... I believe you're gonna see the same theme over and over again, that God is a redeemer. That God is a redeemer. And I believe that there's people in this room today or maybe watching online that you need to know that God can redeem your story. So I'm gonna invite Pastor Richard to come and he's going to lead us in some testimony time. Can you give it up for Pastor Richard? <clears throat> So, yeah, we are so excited and tired to be back here in Bellevue, Nebraska. If you're wondering why Pastor Michelle is wearing a blanket, it is because it was 88 degrees all last week in Puerto Rico, and we are now back home. Uh, but, man, I, I know I've shared with many people today, uh, we were only gone for a week from, from uh, Saturday to Saturday, but it feels like we've been gone for a month because all of our days were so full of work and ministry and team time that, 
uh, that whole week, I want you guys to understand, was so maximized in so many ways. Uh, we got to serve uh, at this church, and the lead pastor of that church, his name was Pastor Hector. And uh, the, some of the work that we got to do is we were helping them build a community center. Uh, you see, this, this community we were in, they're still recovering from the hurricane. And so there's still a lot of damage, and there's still a lot of trash all over the place because a lot of their stuff was ruined. And so they just have trash all over their yard because they haven't had the time or the resources to get rid of that just yet. And so we're helping build a community center. So we had some people that were laying block on the walls so that they can continue to build the block and, and, or build the walls and we can get that roof in there. Uh, other of us, we were uh, tying together rebar, which if you've never done that, there is never a more fun thing in your life than tying rebar. Uh, which, fun fact, um, the, uh, Pastor Hector said that the last team was, they were able to finish three rebar columns. Uh, our team, we finished 10 rebar columns in the time we were there. Uh, there's also a lot of grounds around there. So we got to help clean up the grounds. We got to help deep clean the church. Uh, we got to help them do some work that is just really labor intensive, like moving blocks and moving lumber and moving sand and rocks. And, uh, and I, I was telling a lot of people that we'd get home and, and we'd go, get to our hotel rooms about 9, 9.30 and everyone just passed out. There was no hanging out. There was no having fun. We were just so uh, done with our day. They're like, we need to sleep so we can redo it uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, we also had some time to go and we took food, bags of food, and we walked through the neighborhoods. And uh, one of the things you'll know about these houses is you can't walk up to their front door because they're all gated. And so Pastor Hector, he would walk up to each gate and goes, Buenos dias! And he would just yell at them until they'd come out of the house, which by the way, Andy said, I'm allowed to do, okay? So if you hear me yelling outside of your house, Pastor Hector and Pastor Andy told me I can do that. But he would just yell at them until they would come out and then, and then, They'd come out and they would share a story and Pastor Hector would translate and then we'd bless them with some food. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of what we did. Um, and, and these four are gonna help us uh, understand a little bit more from their perspective, what God maybe did in them or through them. And we're gonna start with Irma. Irma, come on up. Good morning, everyone. For those who doesn't know me, I'm from Bellevue Christian Center. They didn't smug me in <laughs> because I'm Hispanic. <laughs> but um, I just want to thank for the opportunity that I'm giving to share my um, experience through this mission trip, which is a lot, but I'm just kind of go through some important ones, and I had to write it down so that I don't forget it. <laughs> um, through the beginning of our meetings, we talk about uh, connecting and um, building, building relationship with each other. And, um, and through our devotional too, we talk about um, the importance of um, humility and gratitude. And it was um, in the midst of those sharing moments, uh, I understood um, something that I have an empty hands, and that I have nothing to give unless God works first inside of me in my life. So, um, and then um, one time I, I, in my prayers, I, I ask God and say, hey, don't let me do anything or don't let me go anywhere if you're not going with me which is Moses' um, prayer when God asked him to lead um, his people. So, um, and I said that same prayer, that moment that I, I felt that I have nothing to give. And then uh, I remember that, um, that nothing what I do or whatever I do is not me and it's not mine that everything comes from God. Um, so, to me, it was an opportunity to God, for God to work inside of me, to work in my life, to also um, let him use me and fill my empty hand. And, um, and going through the neighborhood and seeing the need of people, 
I remember also um, Moses saying, show me your glory. And um, there was a family through, through us um, going to their house and saw us walking, um, yelling at houses. And they probably didn't expect us going also to their house. And we went, walked out of their house, and the guy already, um, his name is um, Victor, and he already been through a lot of surgery, and he was going to go through more. And he said, this was a good time. It was not our timing. It wasn't us. It was God's timing. It was the right time that we walked up there and, and had the chance and had the opportunity to pray for him. But he wasn't the only one who received the blessing. I also received the blessing. And I think all of us that was there, we also received the blessing. And um, what I want to say is thank you to all of you guys that um, supported us, prayed for us. Um, we, I think we all get blessed for whatever we do. You guys bless us so that we can bless others' life. But also we are here to bless you guys with the experience for what you guys do. So thank you. Next up, we're going to have Keziah share. Um, Keziah, it was interesting because some of our team members, they would hear a knock at their door, and when they'd open the door, nobody was there. And Keziah and I are trying to figure out what was going on because we have no idea either. So, <laughs> But it was so fun having Keziah on the trip, and uh, it was so encouraging to have her on the trip. She was uh, the one that was making us laugh, and even though you didn't get as tan as me, uh, it's so, still so cool to see God do some cool things. So, Keziah, why don't you share with us a little bit about what God did in you or through you on this trip? Yeah, so um, this was my first mission trip, and I think I'm very lucky being able to go on a trip like this at my age, because I know not many people get the chance to. So um, I kind of went in already knowing that, like, oh, I was going to like this, because I had Pastor Michelle, who is probably the best pastor. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I didn't really think I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. Um, I mean, like, I have always grown up knowing God and knowing that, like, Jesus loves me and everything. But, like, going into this mission trip just helped me understand that way more and helped me realize what it's like to feel that way. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm far along with my walk with God, but... Um, and it's not like I try pushing him away or anything. I just, I struggle trying to, like, further our relationship. So um, just being on this mission trip has really helped me. And I didn't really know why I wanted to go on this trip. I just was like, oh, going to Puerto Rico and being able to go on a mission trip with my mom just sounded, like, really cool. But um, I, the entire trip we were just talking about, like, the whole point of being here I mean, yeah, obviously to help um, create the community center, but also to um, make relations. And these, like this past week, I have connected with people who I didn't even know. And I just feel like that's just what God wanted me to do. He wanted me to just create relationships with people. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we'll have the cold one come up. Also known as the best pastor on staff. <laughs> ah, just kidding. All right, saludos desde Puerto Rico. Yo soy Boricua y ma, mi familia soy de Ponce, Puerto Rico. So for those of you that do not speak Spanish, um, welcomes greetings from Puerto Rico. Uh, my family is from Ponce, Puerto Rico, so I am actually Puerto Rican. Um, so for me, getting a chance to go to Puerto Rico, I've been to Puerto Rico before, I've been to Ponce before, um, but for God to align it so that I was able to go to the place that my family is from, my, my grandfather, for those of you who don't know, which is going to be most of you, um, my grandfather was actually a pastor for 30 years in Ponce, Puerto Rico. 
So for me to go to the place where my family is from and to be able to serve the people of Ponce was like an incredible, an incredible gift from God. Um, it was great to be around people who, even though they weren't family, they felt like family. The people that we talked to, I was like, you sound like my uncle. They would greet me the way Puerto, Ric Puerto Ricanos greet each other. We'd hug each other, give each other a kiss on the cheek. And so it just felt immediately like family to me. Um, and I loved it. I loved the food, of course. It was amazing. Um, but the things that I, that God did inside of me, far surpassed anything that I could have imagined. Um, you know, I've always had this dream as somebody who, uh, my native tongue was actually Spanish. I don't speak well now, but um, once I got into full-time ministry, I was like, man, it would be really cool to one day be able to preach an entire message in Spanish. I'm like, that, would, that is like on my bucket list to do. Um, I didn't get to do that because I'm not good enough yet. Um, but what God did do is he did give us an opportunity on Tuesday night to speak to Pastor Hector's church. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna speak in Spanish. Um, even though I felt nervous and I was like, you know, my Spanish isn't the best, but you know, why not? Why not allow God to take an opportunity to use me in a way that maybe is a little uncomfortable for me, but who knows the next time I'm gonna get an opportunity like this. And so I did it and it went all right. Um, so that was an amazing gift. And you know, something that I hadn't really told a lot of people, but it, God knew. So it was just a little thing, a little gift from God to me. Um, the other, th there's so many more, but the other, one of the other big things was Sunday when we got into Puerto Rico, we stayed in San Juan and we, um, attended church there, and uh, which is, it was a great church service. But the pastor was talking about something that all of us have probably heard for years, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm like, got it, yes. Heard it, heard this message a billion times, especially growing up in church. But the way that this pastor described it, there was something that inside of me, the Holy Spirit was able to do a work in Give me revelation that I've never been able to have before. And there are so many things that God lined up. And I think that the, being in Ponce, or being in San Juan in Puerto Rico for this was just one of those things that God's like, you, this is something that you need to know in a place that is like home to you. Um, and so as the pastor is explaining it, you know, he's like, you know, it's not about the ministry you do. It's not about your gifts and talents. I'm like, yes, yes, I know. Um, he's like, it's about God having your whole heart. Does God have your whole heart? When you go up to heaven, God's not going to ask you, how did your ministries go? How many people were saved? Uh, how, did that have, how did your trunk or treat go, Michelle? Did the kids know all their Bible verses? He's going to be like, did I have your whole heart, Michelle? And I was like, oh, man. I, just, I was just like crying the whole service. They're like, oh, that poor white girl, she's, she's getting saved right now. Um, but I, I was like, God was just doing a work. And I felt like for the first time in my life, I got it. I got it. I was like, you know what, you're right. It's not about it's not about the stuff I do here on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's what I'm doing in my prayer closet. It's what I'm doing on a daily basis talking to God. And so if that was, that was not the only thing that I got, but if that was the only thing that I got out of this mission trip, I'd, hands down, it would have been amazing because that's something I've never been able to. So I know it's going to continue to be a journey, but I just thank God for the opportunity. Thank you guys for the opportunity to let me go. And finally, we're going to have Brianna share. Um, so this trip was um, amazing. Um, you know, we've had a really hard year. And so being able to go and just continue to serve and give was just a huge blessing to me. Um, so all of you who gave, prayed for us, set the ground before us as we went there. Thank you so much. Um, God did a lot of things with me as well in me. Um, 
But the biggest thing that happened was, um, I don't know how many of you know, but Richard and I have lost four babies um, throughout our marriage. Um, And as we were sitting and talking with Pastor Hector, um, while everybody else was working, um, Pastor Hector has some pretty amazing stories of what God has done in him. And what I found the most amazing thing was that he would seek people out to tell them, to tell us what God has done in him and through him and with him. And it was just, it was amazing because I feel like a lot of times here in America, we, we don't necessarily do that. We don't seek people out to say, let me tell you what God has done in my life. Um, and he was seeking us out. And he, we had a group of us. I can't remember. I know Stephanie was there. I can't remember who else was all sitting there with us. But um, we were talking, and on the back of his shirt, it said, Las, La Esperanza Funcionado. And it's the hope experience. And somebody asked him, what does that mean? And so he started telling it was the hope um, and he told us that two weeks before we came, I am going to cry at some point, so just prepare yourselves. Um, <laughs> but um, two weeks before we came, his daughter lost their first baby girl. And um, he's telling us this story and telling us how he, he walked into the hotel the hospital room and um, they were holding their sweet baby and um, his daughter gave him the baby and said, would you please give this to God and let God know she's his. And, um, and my heart just was like, you know, your mama heart, it hurts for people. And um, he's telling us how they just gave this baby to Jesus. And they said, she's yours. We love her, all of that. And um, I looked at him and I said, you want to know something? (laughs) Um, Richard and I have lost four babies and we lost our first one. And his, he just was shocked. Um, And I said, when we lost our first baby, I was angry. I was angry at people. I was angry at myself. I was angry at my body. I was angry that I couldn't produce this thing that I know Richard and I wanted for so long. We wanted to be parents. I knew God had called me to be a wife and a mom, and I was angry. I didn't know why God took that from me or what was going on, and I remember driving. I can't remember if I was driving to work or from work, but I said, God, you better give me something to hold on to because I'm I'm dying inside. I need you to give me something that gives me hope because I am hopeless right now. Um, And I was telling him this, and I said, and God at that moment gave me this picture of my grandma up in heaven holding my baby and smiling at me and I was bawling in the car, and as soon as that happened, I stopped crying. I was like, for sure. Who better to raise my baby than Jesus and my grandma? My grandma was like the greatest woman on the earth. Um, And it was just this ray of hope that I had never experienced before. I grew up in the church And um, as I'm telling them this, he just raises his hands and is just like, hallelujah, that's what I needed. I needed that hope. Um, So that Tuesday night after we all shared, um, he asked me to get up and share that story with the congregation. And um, his daughter was there and we were able to pray together and I prayed over her and, um, and not one. Not two, but three women approached me that night telling me how much hope that brought them, that what God has brought me through, that we have four in heaven and we have four on earth, and we get to meet those when we get there, Um, and how much hope that brought to other people. And it was one of those things that I I said after each of our losses, I said, God, there's got to be a purpose There's got to be a purpose for this deep pain in my heart. I will never let this go to waste. 
I will never let what you've brought me through be silenced, be diminished, because it's you who gets the glory. Um, and so that's, that was our biggest thing this week. And God gave me, showed me those four palm trees. You know, everywhere we go, I feel like when I'm, when I'm going through my emotions again and again of, of our losses, um, God gives me these pictures of four things. And um, one time it was at Hobby Lobby, and I'm walking through, and there's these four wooden angels sitting there, and there were only four. Um, and this week, I saw these palm trees every day right outside our door. And one day, I stood there, and I saw, I was like, oh, there's four. And it was just overwhelming. Those little God moments do not take them for granted. What God can do in those silly little th moments that you feel are insignificant to others can be so much to others and to you. So that's my story. You know, so there's things that we can plan for on mission trips. We, we can plan for the work that we're going to do. We can plan for the team time and where we're going to stay and, and all of that. But there's also this plan that we don't know about. And there are so many things that happen on this trip that, that in the church we call those divine appointments. Um, you know, they are trying to continue to build on to their church so that they can provide for the community. And they recently built a tool, built a tool shed, but the electrical in that tool shed was so messed up and they couldn't figure out how to work it. Well, crazy enough, we had a licensed electrician on our team who was able in that week to get that whole tool shed working properly how it should so it's not going to burn to the ground. <laughs> Brianna just shared that, that two weeks prior, the, uh, we, we came into a, to a broken pastor having to mourn the loss of his granddaughter. And who better than to have a team, uh, bring on a team of Mothers who have experienced that loss and could minister to not just Pastor Hector, but to his daughter and to those other women in that church as well that were hurting. As we were walking around the community and praying, we went to this house of this lady and she was sharing with us that her husband was in the final stages of cancer, that he was inside and they were washing him because she thinks that he's in his final days. Well, in February, my wife had to walk through those final days with her father and so she got to pray with her. And then in addition, we asked Pastor Hector just to share with us uh, his vision for the community center. And, and one of the big things that he shared was empowering women and, and, and helping take care of single mothers. Well, we had five single mothers on our trip building that community center, and I don't think it's by accident. These are things that we didn't plan for and we didn't know. And that's one of the things that we, we talk about the team is just know there's stuff about this trip that we're not prepared for, but we're going to be ready for it. And it was so cool watching this team, and I shared with the, the team that uh, I understand what Paul is saying uh, in Philippians and in Galatians and Colossians when he said, thank you so much. Thank you so much for supporting us. Because Bellevue Christian Center, I don't think you understand the impact you had on that community in Ponce. You may have not went... Uh, physically, but you guys sent funds and you guys sent people ready to love on that community. And we're so incredibly grateful. And that's why I love these missions trips because what God can do in seven days, and, and I think our whole team will tell you that God probably did more in their lives in these last seven days than they've experienced in the last year. You know, one of the things that, that from my story is Michelle led a devotion on uh, Wednesday because we did devotions every single morning and it, was on, and it was about gratitude. And so, you know, I'm going through the motions of she's like, all right, so let's just all take time and just thank God. So I'm thinking of, okay, what can I be thankful for? I'm thankful for my kids. I'm, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for, you know, that you provide. And, and God said, no, I, I want you to thank me for your arthritis. And I said, but God, I'm not thankful for my arthritis. <laughs> Because it was, it was terrible. You know, the day before, um, this is embarrassing for me, just so y'all know. I don't like not being able to do things. And I reached a moment 
where my hands weren't working anymore and I had to walk away from the job that I was responsible for. So Wednesday morning, God said, I want you to thank me for your weak hands. And what he spoke to me through that is he said, when you fight against your weakness, you're fighting against my grace. Because that's what Paul said, that I'm thankful for my weakness because it's in that weakness that your grace Actually, the version I read, that in that weakness, it's where God's power works best. And the whole time trying to do this in my strength, God says, you're fighting against my grace. And then he also said, he said, Richard, even when you can't do the work, I'm still proud of you. And it was that humbling moment. Why am I crying? I think I spent too much time with Andy this week. It was in that moment that, um, that God just challenged me. He's like, don't just thank me for the good things in your life. Because sometimes the bad things are there for a reason. Sometimes the tough things, sometimes the weak, weak things are there for a reason. And they're not things that you need to shy away from. They're things you need to lean into. Because we are missing out on what God wants to show us. So church, thank you. Thank you. Our whole team, they would love to stand up here and tell you all personally, thank you. Because this week was powerful for Ponce, for Pastor Hector, for Katie, our trip leader, and then also what God did inside of our team. So thank you guys. If ever you've had any questions about whether or not miracles happen, the fact that Pastor Richard just cried in front of anyone (laughs) is miraculous. Friends, this is who God is. He's a redemptive God by nature. He's a God who reaches into broken things and builds something beautiful. Working for a week on a community center in a community that's been just decimated by hurricane activity, you see the beauty in what God is building. But you don't get to see the beauty of what God builds if you ignore the rubble and the destruction that was there first. Genesis chapter 38 is this oddball chapter that seems sandwiched in between the story of Joseph. We kick off with this introduction to Joseph and how his brothers treat him once he vocalizes this dream that God has given him. Chapter 37, we get this hint of this young boy who's given this great purpose and this desire to do something big for God, and his brothers see that and they say, let's kill this dreamer. Chapter 39, we continue Joseph's story, and we'll get there next week as we see all of the ups and downs, the twists and turns of his life and how God was always there to provide. But Genesis 38 is this story that highlights these two characters, Judah and Tamar. Judah, one of Joseph's brothers, Judah, who was involved in this uprising to kill Joseph. Judah, who said, yes, let's throw him in this pit. Yes, let's kill the dreamer. Actually, we don't gain anything by killing him. Let's sell him, Judah. Judah, who will find in Genesis 38, makes one sinful decision after another. 
First he plots to kill his brother. Then he leaves his family unit and decides, I'm gonna go make it on my own in this town that is filled with godlessness. And he finds himself a wife and he has three children and these three boys end up further and further and further away from God than Judah was. And that should be a lesson to us as parents when we allow values to erode we can expect our children to ignore those values, to step away completely, to go further than you and I ever went. We see that play out. Judah, who arranges a marriage with his first son and a woman named Tamar, Tamar, who's now this main character in Genesis 38, who was thrust into the story because she was forced to marry someone. Tamar marries the first of Judah's sons. And this son of Judah is so wicked that God says, I'm going to take his life. I can't allow this to continue. And in that culture, in that time, it was then the duty of the next son to marry Tamar and to produce a child to continue the first son's name and lineage and honor. But that second son, equally as wicked as the first son, says, I'm not gonna do that. I don't want any part of carrying on someone else's legacy. I'm only concerned with me. So he refuses to produce a child with Tamar. God sees his wickedness and takes his life as well. There's still one more son who can step in and do the thing that God had designed at that time to be done. But Judah has already lost two sons and thinks to himself, I don't want to lose a third. And there seems to be something about this woman or this marriage that keeps losing me kids. See, it's interesting that he fails to see that it was the wickedness of his own sons and nothing to do with this woman, Tamar. So he makes an empty promise to Tamar. Why don't you go live back with your parents and I'll eventually give you my third son so that you can have children. And Judah, knowing the whole time he's not going to follow through, hopes that maybe the whole situation will just be forgotten. So Tamar goes back home and she's spending a time living as a widow, dressing in widow's clothing, showing to the whole community, I've experienced loss and I'm not moving on yet. By wearing this widow's clothing, she's also honoring the commitment that Judah had made with her saying, I'm holding out for this promise that this man gave me. Well, the time comes when Judah's wife passes away. He goes down into the town where Tamar is living and he has sheep that he's going to shear. And along this road, he sees this woman who he believes to be a prostitute. In reality, it's Tamar, who's heard that her father-in-law is coming down to shear his sheep. She changes clothes and dresses as a prostitute. Eventually, the two get together. Tamar becomes pregnant, and Judah has no idea that it was Tamar the whole time. See, there's something interesting that points to how far Judah has fallen away, the brokenness and the rubble and the destruction that he's causing in his own life. See, Tamar, as she's sitting beside the road and the way that she was dressed and the coverings that she was wearing would suggest that she wasn't just an ordinary prostitute, but that she was a shrine prostitute. Meaning that any person that was to sleep with her was not only just sleeping with a prostitute, but was choosing 
to worship another God. See, it was often believed that a man would come and during this time of shearing sheep, he would sleep with one of these prostitutes, believing that then that God would produce fertility, would bring blessing. You see, so Judah wasn't just sleeping with this woman. He had fallen away from the God he was supposed to be fully devoted to. Well, in the process, he gives a sign, a, a, a staff, a signet ring or, 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 or a signature type of thing that says, this is my stuff. And Tamar has these things. Eventually, the truth comes out that Tamar is pregnant. And listen to this craziness of Judah's response. He, he doesn't know that it's his child yet. But he hears that Tamar is pregnant and he decides she should be put to death for not honoring a commitment he never planned to fulfill. Tamar then displays this staff and this signet and says, well, the person who these things belong to is the father of this child. And Judah realizes that's my stuff. And suddenly that oh no moment sets in. The realization of what I've done, the sin that I've committed, my filth and unrighteousness is now laid before all to see. And he makes this statement. He says, she is more righteous than I am. Now, every time I've read that in the past, I've thought, how is she righteous? <laughs> I'm not saying she's the problem or the cause, but it seems to me like nobody's righteous in this scenario. And it dawned on me that, true, she's not innocent and clean in this whole thing, but it is true that she is more righteous than Judah was. Now, why this story? Why Genesis 38? God, why not just go 37 to 39? Can't we just read Joseph's story seamlessly without this weird hiccup and interruption? What does it matter, all of the brokenness and craziness that went on in Judah and Tamar's life? Because Genesis 38 is a picture of how God uses broken people to create beautiful stories. See, one of the amazing things about Judah and Tamar is that those two, with all of their brokenness, see, Judah, his rubble, his destruction was caused by his own sin. And some of us in this place, we relate to that. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've gotten ourselves into a lot of sin. We have wrecked our own lives over and over and over again. Some of us have found ourselves so covered in debris and rubble from the terrible choices we've made, it's left us wondering, God, could you ever do anything in my life again? Judah's brokenness was caused by his own sin. Tamar's was caused by the way she was treated, the pain, the hurt, the injustice. But both, both lives were wrecked. And yet here's this beautiful picture of God, the redeeming God. The God who comes into the brokenness and begins to build. See, we've been reading in Genesis, but we pick up Judah and Tamar's story many, many, many books later in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, as we're being introduced to the lineage and the genealogy of Jesus himself. It's interesting to me that as you look at the genealogy of Jesus, Judah and Tamar are called out by name. 
over this past couple weeks as I've read Genesis 38, I've asked this question many times. God, why Judah? Like, why not Joseph? Why didn't you pick the one brother who seemed to be faithful to you? Why didn't you use the one brother who through all of the ups and downs, the craziness, he, he, he didn't just turn away from you and run and do his own thing. Instead, he trusted you. Like I can't imagine through prison, through, through false accusations, I can't get too deep into his story because I just it amazes me. But why not Joseph? Why Judah? I wish I knew exactly. I wish I could tell you that God showed up in my prayer times and was like, this is exactly what I was thinking when I saw Judah. But he hasn't done that. But I realized, you know who I relate to more? Judah, not Joseph. I've spent more of my life living like Judah, turning my back on a good and faithful God, than like Joseph. God, I'll trust you through whatever. And Judah's life reminds someone like me that my story's not over. That there's redemption for those of us who have been lost in sin. Well, God, why Tamar? Why would you use this woman? What's so special about her story and, and, and what's so significant about her life that you would specifically put her name at the beginning of this beautiful story that points to Jesus. I believe it's because there's men and women in this room whose lives have been wrecked, destroyed, blown apart by abuse, neglect, mistreatment, dishonor. And God wants you to know that your story's not over either. That he's a redeemer of the broken things and the painful places. That, that he's a God that can use a story of pain and loss and send you to a people that you don't know. And as you share about the rubble in your life, hope is built in someone else's. Why does Genesis 38 exist in the story? Because you and I need to know that despite our brokenness, God can build something beautiful. I want to invite Pastor Richard to come. There's one more story that he's going to share. I believe that this story gives us the clearest picture of what God wants to do with the broken places in our lives. Of what God can do when we surrender the destruction. And say, God, what can you build out of this? And as he shares this story, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking to individuals in this room saying, there's brokenness that I want to redeem. Whether it's the sinful decisions you've made or the pain caused by others, there's a redeeming God in this place who wants to build something new. Pastor Richard, will you come? So there was a moment when we were building a rebar column. You can see it there at the bottom. And Pastor Hector was just sharing uh, with us what he was building or what we were building. And it's this community center that we shared about. And it's been this dream. This community center has been this dream that God has placed on Pastor Hector's heart for a long time. And Pastor Hector stopped us from our work, uh, which bugs me because I want to work. Uh, but Pastor Hector stopped our whole team. And he said, come here. And he began to share with us the story of his best friend, Jefferson. And Jefferson, he said, was his right-hand man. 
Jefferson, uh, he was hoping that Jefferson would become the lead pastor of the church that we were at someday. And, and God was, or Hector was talking to God. He was like, is Jefferson who's next? And God kept saying no. And Hector's like, I don't get it. Jefferson is so incredible. He's so amazing. He'll do great things. And God kept telling him no. Well, there's one day that Jefferson came to Pastor Hector and he told him, he said, I had a dream last night that this is my last day on earth. Uh, whether it's true or not, he, I don't know if he knew in the moment, but he said, if that's true, I wanna serve as best I can today. And so he said, Pastor Hector, what can I do? And Pastor Hector said, uh, this family needs groceries. Can you go to Walmart and buy them some groceries and take them? So, so he said, Jefferson got in his car, he drove to Walmart, got groceries and took it. And then he came back and said, Pastor Hector, what do you need? And Pastor Hector was like, well, we need some paint uh, to finish this project. And so uh, Jefferson drove to Home Depot and got some paint and came back and he started painting that stuff. And he's like, uh, Pastor Hector, what else do you need me to do? And he's like, well, uh, we need to go clean this room over here because it's just really messy. And so uh, Jefferson goes into this building and he starts to clean clean this room. Uh, Pastor Hector, uh, while Jefferson's doing that, Pastor Hector is doing something else and he hears this crash. And what happened was this, this wall that Jefferson was cleaning by collapsed on top of him. And Pastor Hector ran over and he saw this and uh, Jefferson was unresponsive. So Pastor Hector's calling 911. And then he comes back to, to, to Jefferson, and when he comes back, he sees Jefferson breathe his last breath. And while Pastor Hector is telling us this story, we can just see the tears coming out of his eyes because that's what Jefferson meant to him. And uh, you know, obviously they, the ambulance took Jefferson away, and this next missions team after that, they came in and they said, uh, you know, they're ready to work. And they said, hey, do you want us to clean up this rubble? And Pastor X says, no, 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 don't touch it. That rubble was still stained with Jefferson's blood. And for Pastor Hector, it was a remembrance of how amazing Jefferson was. So the next team came in and like, hey, do you want us to clean this rubble? And Pastor X said, no, 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 leave it, don't touch it, don't touch it, because Pastor Hector wasn't ready to let go of it yet. And then a few months later, uh, Convoy of Hope had an excavator on site. And uh, they had some people that were familiar with concrete work as they were getting to re ready to lay the foundation for this community center. And they heard this story about Jefferson. And so happens on this trip that there was somebody who had been working an exca excavator for years. And he said, Pastor Hector, if you want, we can make this rubble into the foundation of this dream. And Pastor Hector said, that's it. Because Jefferson wanted to give his life for this community. And so he took the excavator and, and they got all of that rubble and they put it where the foundation was gonna be laid for this community center. And that community center is built on the blood of a man who so loved that community and wanted his life to be known for serving that community. And that's what we got to build on top of. And uh, Pastor Hector said these three things that made Jefferson soul, S-O-L, submission, obedience, and loyalty. And it's just a beautiful picture of how God took this tragedy, this rubble, and built something so beautiful on top of it. As we close our time together this morning, I just wanna ask a simple question that, that maybe for some will will awaken a new sense of hope. It's a question that I believe for many of us, we need to wrestle with, we need to take out of this place, we need to go to God with over and over and over again. But the question is just this, what could God build out of the brokenness in your life? 
What could God build out of the brokenness in your life? Maybe you're in this place and you're struggling with receiving this message. What do you mean God can redeem these broken parts? What do you mean all of the sin in my life, God can still use me? What do you mean all of the hurt and the pain and the loss and the grief? What do you mean God can use those things? Maybe you're wrestling with that and you don't know how to take the next step. I want you to know that at Bellevue Christian Center, there's a group, it's called Freedom Group. And you see these people, maybe you've seen them already this morning, but they've got these red shirts. Pastor T's got one on wherever he's at. He's got a shirt on that says Freedom Group. And if you have questions, how do I take another step? And starting that process of God rebuilding the broken places in my life. I encourage you to stop one of them. Find out a little bit more about Freedom Group. If you're here today and your life is broken because of the sin in your life. Scripture makes it very clear that you and I can't rebuild that on our own. We can't fix what's been broken by sin in our own strength. The Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, then we can be rescued and set free and the brokenness of sin. So maybe today that's a decision that you want to make, that you want to decide, I'm going to believe in my heart and I'm going to confess with my mouth that my only hope is Jesus. I'm gonna start a faith journey with him. See, that begins the rebuilding process. What we're going to do this morning is we're gonna open up these altars and we're just gonna invite anyone who feels that they need to come and just spend a little bit of time with God to come and bring the brokenness before him or to come and just say, God, I don't know what's next, but I want you to be involved in it. We're not gonna have an official dismissal. I'm not gonna come back in a few minutes and say, okay, now it's time for you to go. We're just gonna open up this space. If you're ready to go, you're welcome to. But if you'd like to spend some time at these altars, we'd love to pray with you. So I'm gonna say a simple prayer. And I'm gonna invite you, the church, to pray this along with me, to repeat after me. And if there's anybody in this place that would like to make a decision to put your faith in Jesus, then as I pray these words, nothing magical about these words, I just wanna invite you to pray these words from your heart. And after I say amen, the worship team's gonna to begin to sing, to lead us in a time of just responding and reflecting. And you are welcome to go whenever you feel it's time to go. You can stay here till three o'clock. Pastor T will stay with you. So all across this place, if you'll close your eyes, bow your heads with me and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus this, morning, this morning, I make a decision, make a decision. to put my faith in you. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I ask that you would come into my life, that you would begin to build something beautiful out of my brokenness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, we're gonna spend some time responding we look forward to seeing you again next week as we finish our Genesis series.
Set for 